Junior was born and raised about 30 minutes up the road from here in Stellarton, one of our province's many coal mining towns. According to his website, he grew up on Red Row, a neighborhood known for its company houses. Those are those old duplexes built by the company um, that they've been able to rent to their miners. Those houses have outlived the industry. Following his high school graduation in 1982, he went on to study English at St. Avex, creative writing at the University of British Columbia, and finally education at Dalhousie. And it was that last degree that brought him here to Toronto, where he's been teaching since 1994. A few weeks ago, at the launch of One Book Nova Scotia in Halifax, Mr. McKay told everybody in attendance he felt like Jason Bourne this summer, but he had a bit of a secret identity. He knew his book, 26, had been selected to be the first title read as part of the One Book Nova Scotia initiative. But he couldn't tell anybody. He was sworn to secrecy. He didn't even tell his children until the night before the launch, and then only because he had to explain why he was skipping school. <laughs> I don't know how he did it, but he kept it to himself. Since then, he's been visiting libraries across the province, from Cape Breton to Yarmouth. He has walked a lot of miles in a very short period of time. But tonight, he is home. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's where we're going to Thanks, Leslie. Uh, I'm pretty sure i got to fill out a report about you, Leslie, because uh, if you're going from Truro to Stellar in 30 minutes, <laughs> You are exceeding the speed limit. <laughs> um, hello and uh, welcome everybody. I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's just been an interesting month for me and I've been all over the province and uh, every every place I've gone, it's just it's been a real education for me. Um, I'm going to read from this book, 26, and uh, I'm going to read about three selections from the book. Uh, one selection is relatively long, so I'm going to um, <clears throat> warn you about that in advance. Um, I'm also going to give a preliminary language warning. What should I say about language? Um, I was, uh, a number of years ago, I uh, heard this British poet read, his name was Simon Armitage, and um, he read this poem that had the F word in it, and uh, it was a great poem, and the F word came in right at the end, and uh, he read the poem, and then he said that he had read the poem at a British high school, and after the reading, the headmaster called him into his office and said, young man at this school, we do not appreciate poems with the language in them. <laughs> so, there's language coming up. Um, now, this is the, the first scene that I'm going to read is um, it's not the long scene that I'm going to read. It's medium-ish. Um, and now, one of the things that this book deals with is uh, there's a kind of generational gap in the book. <coughs> Uh, there's a tension between generations, and um, there's a soft, comfy seat right there. <laughs> uh, there's a tension between generations in the in the town, and the town in the book is called uh, Albion Mines, but it's based on the town of Stellarton where I grew up. And um, the generational tension in the book was one that I was very familiar with myself when I was growing up because. Uh, I grew up in an industrial area where at least two generations of my family had worked in industry. And that's kind of what was expected. That was a job. That was an industrial job. And um, for people of my generation, the industries were gone. And so you had two generations of people who expected something of you, and you couldn't deliver on it. Uh, and so in the book, that there's some tension between the father and the sons because the father expects his sons to get what he considers a real job, um, but there are no real jobs to be had. And so at one point in the book, the, um, both sons, who are in their 20s by this time, actually get hired on at the new mine in the town. And uh, the father decides to take the sons out and get drunk with them. <laughs> To celebrate. Now, this is this scene is what I consider a comic scene. Um, 
and I was in, a, in Sydney a couple weeks ago, and I introduced the scene by saying this is a comic scene. And then I was halfway through the scene reading, and I realized it's not very funny. <laughs> uh, people are just angry at each other. They're shouting. Uh, anyway, there's a little bit of comedy at the end. I think of this as a comic scene. Um, another, there, I have one more little detail to tell you about. The, um, Sometimes people want to know, like, you write a novel uh, and they, they get to meet the person who wrote a novel and they want to know, well, what's, how much of that book is real? Um, there's a jukebox in this scene and there's some people in this room who may need to explain to them what a jukebox is. I'm going to go without explaining it. Google it. Those of you who need the explanation, just pull out your smartphone and Google it. Uh, the jukebox in this scene is a real jukebox. Uh, the jukebox is based on a, a jukebox that I knew growing up. It was at Leo's Pool Hall in Stellarton, no relation. <laughs> and uh, the jukebox would, could, would only play one song. No matter what you pressed, it played Bad Case of Loving You by Robert Palmer. <laughs> um, and um, I thought it was a nice metaphor for the father's relationship with the sons because like, no matter what happened, they fought. So in good times they fought, in bad times they fought. Uh, and anyway, so the jukebox is real. <clears throat> Finally, his sons had begun lives he could understand. So what if they were in their middle 20s and he had started his working life at 16? They were finally going to do real work. For the first time ever, the three of them were going to do something together, get drunk. Two more pitchers, he shouted towards the bar. It was a quiet night at the Tartan Tavern. A few people were scattered here and there throughout the room. Most of the action was taking place in the snooker area where every table was full and the players leaned seriously and quietly over their cues as though some money might be at stake. Christ, boys, Ennis said when the pitchers he'd ordered arrived. He threw back his head in reverie. I remember when I was starting at the car works. He shook his head and laughed. A clatter of snooker balls punctuated his speech. Those were crazy times. We were kids back then, just kids, a lot of us. Quit school in grade seven, eight, nine, start earning your keep young. That's something young people today don't understand. He hadn't meant this as a dig at his sons, but Arvel began to bristle in response. Another thing we don't understand Arvel said, is how anyone could quit school in junior high and get any job, let alone a good one, let alone keep it. Ziv shook some salt into the palm of his left hand. He prodded the salt with his right index finger as though counting the grains. Ennis put his beer glass down in front of him. He hunched over it and peered quickly back and forth at his two sons. Those jobs were good jobs because we made them good jobs. We organized and we fought for what we wanted. You think the company was tripping over itself to give us a seniority system, a decent wage, holidays? We got that stuff because we were smart enough to demand it. If young people today aren't happy, it's up to them to fix it. You can only make demands if you have an employer, Arvel said. Who are today's young people going to threaten with a strike? The unemployment office? Their social worker? The parents they're living off? Ziv spilled the salt from his palm over his draft. Foam began rising vigorously to the top. Take this guy, Ennis said, indicating Ziv with his thumb. He's been working at Zeller's for years now. If he's not happy, why doesn't he organize? Get a bargaining committee instead of that employee's relations council he's got. Ziv seemed in no mood for a fight and did not reply to his father's dig. Have you had your head up your arse for 30 years? Arvel continued, unemployment for people our age is through the fucking roof. Quit your crying. You're crying about unemployment when you're not even unemployed. Ziv spoke up. Look, he found himself saying, we've both got jobs now, good jobs. Why can't we just sit here, drink a few beer, and act like normal people? Why do we always have to jump around each other screeching like a pack of gorillas? Arvel and Ennis backed off. Each of them would face his own shade of red. I'm going to put on some music, Ziv said. He stood up and jangled the change in his pocket. 
boys won't like it, Anna said. Ziv ignored his father and walked past the pool tables where the regulars were playing snooker. As he approached the jukebox, the snooker players began yelling, don't, don't. Ziv made a face in their direction and put three quarters into the slot. He pressed off some songs. No, the snooker players shouted in unison. Ziv shook his head at them. As he was sitting back down at the table with Arvel and Ennis, the introduction to Bad Case of Loving You by Robert Palmer started up. That's not the song I pressed, Ziv said. No matter what you press, that's what it plays, Ennis said. That song got played so many times that some kind of groove must have got worn in the machine. That's all it knows how to play now. The men at the snooker tables were covering their ears. I guess these guys are pretty sick of this song, Ziv said. The three of them looked at the pool players who were shouting at Ziv, giving him the finger. Well, they're about to hear it six more times, Ziv <laughs> said. And it started to laugh, and his sons joined in. You know what, some comedy in there somewhere? <laughs>
you can't find it. It's one of those things where uh, it's the old, it's like maybe 200 year old municipal road that is out of use. And it's really just kind of a path through the trees at this point. Uh, but it was very close to my house. And uh, I was able to like go over there and go for a walk or go skiing. And so at one point in the early days of working on this book, um, I was actually out on the old Selma Road, and it was one of those amazing um, snowstorms. Uh, you get these late winter snowstorms where just a prodigious amount of snow falls, and somehow it manages to stay in the trees because it's wet. And so there's this enormous amount of snow in the trees, and the trees are hanging over, and you think the trees are going to snap. And uh, what's so great about that is, uh, you know, you get this crazy snowstorm, and then you get this beautiful sunny day, and it's amazing. The sun is reflecting, and you know, most of the time when we're um, living our busy lives or whatever, we see beautiful, amazing things, but we walk right by them, and you don't even notice, you know, and you meet somebody at the end of the day, and they go, wasn't it a beautiful day? And you go, was it? No, oh, I guess I missed that. <laughs> Uh, but on this particular day, I went out skiing and I just happened to notice how amazingly beautiful this place was. And I was skiing and then suddenly I was thinking about my book and I looked around me and I realized, oh man, this is where my book is going to end, right here. <laughs> so this is where the book ends. As light creeps into the sky, Ziv becomes more aware of the snow-laden trees around him. A few branches have cracked under their burdens, but most are arched gracefully in unaccustomed directions. Big spruces and firs stand over him on either side of the trail. Under the weight of snow, they bend toward the ground. Two white spruces, squared off on opposite sides of the trail, appear to be bowing to each other. The tips of their branches reach out across a lifetime's distance toward the other ready to shake hands or embrace. Even evergreens are dormant in the winter, Ziv knows. Not dead, but the next thing to it. After the coldness of a dark season, one that seems to go on forever, they manage somehow to rekindle within themselves a life.